thanks for coming, everybody. Um, so uh, the talk I'm going to be giving you giving you here today is all about GraphQL. Specifically, uh, I'm going to try to convince you to stop writing REST APIs and never deal with it again because they're terrible. And I'm going to show you how to switch to an infinitely better solution, GraphQL. Um, got a, my contact information there. This talks up on GitHub. Um, and just uh, this slide will be repeated at the end uh, if you want to grab a picture. The, the one at the bottom is a great list of GraphQL resources. Everything you could ever want is on that page. Um, so yeah, um, intro, uh, who am I? Uh, my day job, I'm the founder and CTO of a company called Juristat. We sell patent uh, analytics to the intellectual property industry, uh, predictive uh, models, patent search, all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, sell to a lot of big companies that I can't tell you, but you've heard of their names. Um, a lot of patent firms, things like that. Uh, I'm also a founding member of Arch Reactor Hackerspace in St. Louis. Um, Co-organizer of the STL 2600 DC314 uh, meetup. And uh, last year I gave a talk that was pretty popular, I guess, because you invited me back, called uh, Going Commando, about living your life uh, in the command line. Uh, so why am I talking to you today? Uh, I'm going to convince you to switch to GraphQL. REST is terrible and GraphQL is better, and I'm going to prove that to you. Um, why should you listen to me? Uh, my company runs on GraphQL. Uh, over the past two years, we took a, a very traditional kind of REST API um, backed uh, by a single database and converted to a multi-database backend system uh, with GraphQL sitting in front of it. Uh, it's In terms of complexity, the number of types, fields, and the data can access, it's probably one of the largest GraphQL, the most complex GraphQL APIs outside of like a, a Facebook or a, um, you know, GitHub, some of the big, really big guys that use it. Um, like I said, the, one of the big things that, uh, that uh, one of the big advantages for Graph, GraphQL for us has been the ability to integrate with multiple data sources. Not that that's not a thing you can do with REST, but uh, GraphQL makes it especially easy to kind of separate concerns, get things from different sources, and really uh, knit a bunch of different data sources together to make things easy. Um, so, so you can imagine we have a pretty complex data model. Um, all that kind of being said, um, I built a really complex API with GraphQL, and we could not have done it trying to build it with traditional uh, APIs, REST APIs. Um, I'm going to be giving some examples of both REST uh, endpoints and GraphQL. I'm using the Star Wars API. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's an API about the Star Wars universe. Uh, vehicles, people, ships, planets, all that sort of stuff. They have a uh, REST and GraphQL version. So it's a perfect test case to show you like, here's how you do it this way and here's how to do it in a better way. High level, what is GraphQL? Um, Graph query language, kind of what it stands for, as you might expect. Uh, it is a system for encoding a request to some remote system to either retrieve data, mutate some data, uh, something like that. It's, it's a request and response system. Um, it's technically transport independent. The, the GraphQL spec is a spec in terms of the query and response. Uh, there's nothing in the spec of, of how it gets between the server and the client. The transport layer is kind of left up to the user. But in practice, it's almost always used over HTTPS. Uh, some WebSockets uh, implementations exist, but mostly you'll be using it over HTTP. Uh, breaking down kind of the anatomy of a GraphQL query. Um, th this is the, the top line. So we've got there. This is query here is your operation type. Uh, most of the time when you're fetching data, you're doing a query. If you're changing something, it'll be a mutation. Uh, there's some other types, uh, subscriptions, um, inputs, some other kind of weird things. But in day-to-day -day practice, you'll probably only ever use query, mutation, and subscription if you're doing real-time stuff. Uh, the next bit here is get planet. That's an optional name uh, for the query. Um, one of the things you can do is you, you'll, you'll tend to write complex queries in GraphQL, 
and then use the same ones over and over again with different input. So in this case, I'm defining a query called getPlanet that accepts two arguments, ID1 and ID2. Um, we go further, we see, okay, here's the first field I'm requesting. It's planet, and I'm giving the input of the ID I want, ID1 in this case. And then inside of planet, I say I want to know the name and terrains of some planet. Um, but you, you'll notice I've only used one of my inputs there. I'm going to ask for some more input. So now I've got planet 2. And this is uh, a nice feature of GraphQL called labeling, where I can say, when I fetch my data, this top one is just going to be called planet, but this one will have a custom label planet 2. So you can fetch the same field multiple times with different arguments to get back you know, more data than you could conceivably get. Uh, same thing, name, terrains, and that's it. Uh, that's a basic query. There are some more advanced features, but even if you change this to a mutation or a subscription or anything like that, this is going to be the basic structure of your query. It'll be an outer object, select the fields. If those fields have nested fields, you'll select nested fields all the way down. Uh, this is how you'd actually make a query. Um, you'll notice I've done some you don't actually get to display new lines in JSON, but for purposes of display, imagine this is a valid encoded JSON object here. So uh, it's a JSON object, two inputs, query and variables. Uh, query is the query, variables are the variables. So in this case, I've got this random gibberish looking ID string as my input, and the query I talked you through just a second ago. You can also interact with GraphQL through get requests. This is just a URL encoded version of that same thing. Uh, most of the time you'll use posts, but this is kind of handy if you need to embed it into a script. Sometimes it's easier to make get requests, especially if you're just curling it from a command line or something like that. Uh, and then this is what, it get, what you get back. Uh, responses in GraphQL are always via JSON. Uh, there's no XML, no you know, different formats. The response is always via JSON. Uh, and it's always going to follow exactly the query you pass down. So we saw in our query here, we asked for planet with fields name and terrains. And we get back inside of the data object, planet, name, terrains. So who's using it? I mentioned before, Facebook and GitHub. Facebook is the creator of it, um, despite how you may feel about them as a company. And I'm not a fan can't argue that they do cool stuff technically. Um, so it's not encumbered by patents or you know, licensing or anything like that. So if you like the technology, I would encourage you to use it and not let the fact that it's from Facebook stop you. I haven't. Uh, GitHub was another enthusiastic early adopter. Um, a few other big names people have probably heard of. Um, the New York Times uh, did a full re-rollout of their uh, content management system recently using GraphQL. Um, it's one of the more interesting kind of specs I've seen. They took the opportunity to add some metadata and stuff into their stories. Um, it's, it's pretty neat. Um, and in my company, we're not quite as big of a name, but uh, you know, we're certainly using it. Uh, so this next section is where I get into the, the detail of explaining to you why you should use GraphQL. Uh, forgive me for all of my terrible memes. Um, but uh, I hope you enjoy some of them at the very least. Um, why is REST terrible? Uh, the first and most important thing to me is introspection. Um, I don't know, if, if anyone's here as a programmer, you'll probably know what I mean when I talk about introspection. I'm talking about the ability to get information from the API about the API. Um, so if you want to know what fields are available, what types of queries you can make, what what type of data are you going to get returned? Uh, REST has no standard ability to communicate that. Your best bet is you hope that the documentation is good. Um, I've seen really great documentation for APIs, but I'd be surprised if there was a programmer alive who hasn't come across an API either as you know, part of a library or a web API that wasn't poorly documented and you just have to poke at it until you figure out what you're trying to do. Um, so yeah, REST does not have any sort of built-in introspection. 
GraphQL does. Uh, you can query the API directly about all of the fields, all of the types, all of the results, the arguments, the inputs that you can give it. All of that's available programmatically straight from the API, which allows you to interact with a remote API with the same type of like autocomplete um, tools like you'd have locally. So you pull up Visual Studio and you're working, it's going to autocomplete you know, your methods that you're working on when you're doing programming locally. GraphQL brings that to remote, uh, interacting with remote APIs. Just to give you an example of what that looks like. This is a special type of uh, query, an introspection query. Uh, I'm asking about the schema of the API. So this is querying what's the name, uh, description, uh, and fields uh, that are at the root of the query object. So what are the highest level fields you can access? Again, for the Star Wars API, you've got, um, in this case, uh, film. Film is a top level field for getting information about one of the Star Wars films. You've got the description there. You see that it's an object. It's a type of type film. Um, if we want to get some more information about that actual type, we can do another one. This is a query to get type information about the film. Uh, and you'll see this. So now we've got, okay, here are all the fields available on a film. We know that it has a title, which is a string. We know that there's an episode ID, which is, I think, a number. Um, and you've got a description of what it is, so you know exactly what you're going to get back. Predictability. Uh, this is another big one. So when you query a REST API, there's no standard. Again, this is, this is going to be a recurring theme, that there's no standard way to do things. Um, so with REST, you don't know. You might get a string back one time and an integer back the next time when it decides it's going to return something differently depending on the context. You might get a JSON blob back one time, and when you go back a week later, it's, an X, it's XML for some reason. Um, in this case, uh, I'm going to request that URL. What, we have no idea what that's going to look like until you ask. Hopefully, it's going to be the same every time. In this case, this is kind of what it looks like. But there's nothing about this that tells you about this. And that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at here. GraphQL, on the other hand, you get exactly what you asked for every time. Make a query, film ID, title director. We know for a fact, we know from our introspection query, those are both strings. And we get back data film with title and director. Just, you know that your response is going to look exactly like the query you put in, just with the data filled in. How about errors? Uh, errors are everyone's favorite uh, thing, they always happen. Um, with REST, uh, you tend to have one type of failure, and it's everything failing. Uh, you know, you have a 404, you have a 400 error because it didn't like your request. You have a 500 error because of a server error, 404, anything like that. And so, in this case, you ask for a vehicle that doesn't exist, it's a 404 error. It tells you, I can't find it, that's it. Um, you know, you're only requesting one thing at a time, and it's not there, so go to hell. GraphQL, on the other hand, it, since you can request multiple things, things might be coming from different sources, you've got a situation where you might have one part that can fail but other parts succeed. So we look here, uh, we've got the film ID exactly like we had before and we're asking for the tragedy of Darth Plagueis here. Uh, and the response we get back gives us our film and everything just fine, it's happy with that. But the tragedy of Darth Plagueis, not a story the Jedi would tell you, so the, the API doesn't want to return that. You see, we've got right in here the path to what caused the error and the reason the error happened. So if you ask for 10 different things, one of them caused a problem, it's still going to give you nine things and it's going to explain to you, here's why I had trouble explaining this one piece of data to you. Documentation. So this is another really kind of great feature that, that I like. Uh, there's no standard way to, to do docs in REST. Um, I've seen some really well-documented APIs. The Star Wars API, their REST version is very well-documented, but you have to know how to go get the docs to get it. Uh, GraphQL, on the other hand, it's built in. Uh, the docs come to you through those introspection queries. You know exactly how to get the docs for every single field, and they come along with the rest of the tooling. So this is from uh, Graphical, GraphIQL, the, the GraphQL IDE. 
I'll uh, talk a little bit more about that later. Again, this is from the Star Wars API. Um, so you see we get the introspection of you know, total count is an integer, and this is exactly what that integer represents. So instead of having to go somewhere else to some different place to get documentation, it comes to you through the API in a really simple and, and predictable way. Specificity, uh, asking for what you want and getting what you want back. Uh, REST has, is pretty much everything. You ask for an API and it gives you one thing that's formatted and this is exactly what you're going to get back. Um, in this case, let's say I wanted to know Luke Skywalker's name. So people one, I know that's Luke Skywalker, that is everything. And you can see from the scroll bar there's actually quite a bit more there. I don't give a crap about all of that. I don't care what color his eyes are, I just wanted the name. GraphQL solves that problem for you. So we get here, query, person, name. And we get back the name, that's all we care about. Let's go the other way though. Say we want a couple, we want more things. So in this case, I'm asking for three different characters. I happen to know it's Luke Skywalker's C3PO and R2D2. So to do this with REST, you have to make three queries. Uh, sometimes APIs don't like that. You might have to make them one after another. So you've got, in addition to the data transfer and the fact that you don't care about all that data, you're making three round trips and transferring 10K of data when you care about 20 bytes worth of names. I showed you earlier, you can label fields. So we're going to request the same thing. Just get the name for three different people. And there we go. One single request, one back and forth, just the data we care about. Timeliness. So this is another great one. I, I mean, web apps today have become very real time. It's not just you click on a link, it loads a page. You look at it, click on a link, go to another page. Things update and change over time. REST doesn't have a, a good solution to that. There's some attempts to, um, you know, long polling is still unfortunately kind of the state of the art with, with real time web apps in a lot of cases where you make a request and the server just doesn't respond until it's got something to tell you and maybe it just lets it time out. Uh, web sockets are an interesting thing, but there's, again, there's not much framework around there. You have to do it yourself. You have to bring your own kind of back and forth system for that. Um, so let's just say we're interacting with an API where we kick off a job and wait for the results. So here we go, I've posted some data up, it's accepted it, it's processing, 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 and there's the result. I've made four round trips, sent a bunch of network traffic off for, for the, the whole result of just waiting to tell me something was done. As you might expect, GraphQL is gonna do it better. Subscriptions are a first class object in GraphQL. So from the very beginning built into the spec is the idea to say, I want to get updates on this thing. Um, and just like a query, you're going to subscribe to this and then every time there's some sort of change in that data, it's going to post to you a message following this exact format with the updated values you requested. Last but not least on my reasons GraphQL is awesome is updates. Uh, shit changes. You know, you, your API evolves over time. Uh, how do you communicate that to the user? And more importantly, how do you know that you're gonna make a change that's not gonna break things for the user? Um, REST doesn't really have a good system for that. It, it's telling to me that literally the best APIs just use versioned URLs. So api.com slash v1, api.com slash v2. That's literally the best we can do is just changing the URL and keeping the old one running while you build a new one. Uh, for, with GraphQL though, if you build your APIs in, in a conscientious way, then it doesn't matter. Because since the user only asks for the data they need, if you change a field or add an argument or change something you know, in an additive way, their same query is gonna get the same result. So you can add things, add new functionality, add new features, but as long as you make just a minimal effort to not remove things, your clients don't ever have to know unless they, they need the new functionality. What happens if the field size, if field size changes? Well, that's the thing. You, can't, you don't want to change stuff. Um, so if, uh, if, say you have a case, and this, this has happened to us, where we have a field that's type, 
and uh, we decide, oh, this object can actually have more than one type, and so now we want to make it a list. Well, instead of changing the type field, what we would probably do is deprecate that so people know this field isn't, you should transition to something else, and we have a new types field. But during that deprecation process, we haven't immediately broken anything, and you can use introspection tools to say, well, we still have 20 clients using this deprecated field. We need to communicate with them before we break it. It just lets you interact with stuff in a much more seamless way. So that's my convincing part of the talk. Uh, let's say you're all convinced. Good job, good job, me. Uh, you're probably going to want to know how to get started. Um, we start with clients. Um, Graphical, Graph IQL, graph, pronounced graphical, will probably be your first introduction to GraphQL. Uh, Star Wars API is deployed with this, so you can, you can get up there, check it out, play around with it. Um, and it's a full IDE for editing graph, GraphQL queries. It includes documentation, history, auto-completion, uh, syntax highlighting, everything's in line. You said it's deployed with it. Is it a local? Uh, Local host hosting, or is it? No, so it's actually part of the GraphQL server. Um, they recommend not running it on production APIs in general. So, you know, at my company, we just run it with our dev APIs. But you would go to the URL for the GraphQL server, and this is what you'd see. So it's it's built into the server. It's accessed via a website. Although you can run it locally against a remote API if you want to. Uh, there's an upgraded version of Graphical called GraphQL Playground. It's a fork that adds some things like you can have multiple tabs. Uh, it has uh, built-in stuff. This is really handy. Copy curl to immediately export a, a curl command of your current query so you can drop it into a script really easy. Um, and includes some uh, stuff here. Tracing is really nice to be able to track performance of your different bits, bits of code. You can also just make plain HTTP calls. Uh, we saw earlier the post and get request. There's no reason you have to make any, you have to have, you, you'll see a lot of GraphQL clients or GraphQL systems for different languages, but it's just HTTP calls. There's no reason to make it more complicated than it needs to be. Uh, Relay is another one. I'm not much of a front end developer. Um, I know React is really popular among the front end developers. Relay is Facebook system for integrating GraphQL at a very low functional level with React. Um, I don't really know too much about it. Uh, Apollo, same kind of thing. Um, you'll hear me talk about the Apollo server here in a minute. Uh, the Apollo client and server have some proprietary features that work between them that are pretty handy, uh, but you don't have to use those proprietary features and can use them both. You can use the client without the server or the server without the client. Speaking of servers, um, uh, if you're talking about GraphQL, you are probably going to be writing it in Node. Um, there are some GraphQL servers that have come out for other languages, but the almost all of the development velocity right now is in uh, Node.js. Um, it's easy to integrate into existing stuff if you run an Express or a Koa, Happy, uh, any of those you know existing node servers, it's trivial to drop in a GraphQL server. Um, so, yeah. Apollo is the other thing. It's a uh, GraphQL specific server, also written in GraphQL JS, um, provides some additional features on top of it. Um, we use that at Juristat. The big advantage they give us is performance tracking and things like that, but it's by no, it's a, they're a proprietary company. Um, by no means do you have to use them. Okay, uh, getting to an example here, we're going to build out a complete uh, GraphQL server. This is uh, building out our top-level schema. Um, kind of the standard programming example. We've got one field called hello. It's a string, and this function called a resolver returns world. So resolvers are kind of the, from the back end of GraphQL, resolvers are, are, are where it's at. That's kind of everything. So instead of having, uh, you know, a, a rest route where you say, you know, slash people, slash ID, uh, GraphQL has resolvers. So every field and object and type and list and everything will have a resolver that returns the specific data for that field. 
Um, it gets some context about where it's been called, if it has any arguments, that sort of thing. But the, the nice thing is that when you're writing your code, you get to separate that logic. So there's one place in my code where you, know, you fetch, in this case, it's just returning a string, but you can imagine you put database operations in there, you put uh, you know, calculations, anything you want like that. And instead of having that live with a bunch of other stuff in one big API call for a REST thing, it's, we have co-located with the type of the field, the description about it, what it is, what its context is, the code that creates it. Uh, get down a little more. This is create the simplest possible version of a server. Um, and if you were to post against that API, uh, the API, by the way, is in the uh, GitHub uh, repo if you want to run it yourself. Download it, run npm install, and then uh, npm start, and it'll pop this up for you. Um, query hello, data hello world. Uh, if you want to add something slightly more complicated, uh, so we we'll create a new field called testing. Um, this is just a, it has one field called sequence, which accepts an argument of how many numbers it should print out, and then it'll return an array of all of those numbers. So if you say query, testing, sequence, how many, five, it's going to print out zero, one, two, three, four. <coughs> Here is the full code for that. There's some differences because I was debugging that and didn't get the talk updated, but you know, 40, 50 lines to a basic server. Um, and I, I think it's, I'm not sure if it's obvious here, but the thing that's, that for me is one of the big selling points and makes my code a lot cleaner when I'm writing these servers on the background is th this stuff right here. So this, this field definition is just an object that I can pull out into another file when things get too complex. And if I need to use the same field in multiple places, um, say I have a person object and I'm writing a chat system, well you probably want to have a user path to get information about a user, but then you might also want to attach a user object directly to a message. So I can reuse the same bit of code in every context where someone might be interested <laughs> in learning about a user. Uh, since this is uh, FreakNet, I thought I would talk a little bit about the security implications of GraphQL. Oh. I have one question about the implementation. Is, yeah. Uh, so, I've been looking into things like Janus Graph and some of the other Graph DBs. Mm -hmm. How does this integrate with those? I don't have a good answer for that. Um, so, gra the, the Graph in GraphQL is not necessarily tied into the Graph databases. Um, it's more about conceptually thinking of your data as a graph, although it, I believe there is pretty good support for some of those. I just don't have any experience with it. Um, so the security implications of GraphQL, um, author, authentication and authorization, uh, no significant change from REST if you just want to secure a thing, the API at the high level. Um, you can use all the normal HTTP methods. There's not, um, you know, a blessed way of interacting with it. The, the big difference is is at the is at the resolvers. You can do authentication at the field level. Um, and sometimes things aren't resolved in the same way when you access them from different places. So I've got a, a contrived example here. Um, this is basically a copy of a vulnerability we found in our code. Um, so. This is a thing that happens, and it's a thing you have to watch out for. Um, but let's say that our, you know, our chat contrived chat API has a user method that allows you to access uh, information about a user. So I want to fetch information about user with ID five. I get back to that. Okay, user's name is Alice, but we don't want to give you permission to view another user's email address. Uh, in this case, the the top level user object is resolving that and saying. You know, you can see someone's name, but not their email. We've applied that permission at the field level. But let's say, again, going back to our chat example, you have a messages list. And each message has from, to, and the message. The from and the to are just user objects. Think, again, thinking, trying to think of your data as a graph, you're conceptually linking the concepts of a message, message sender, message receiver, to the user. 
So you're drawing that link from this message to a user. And here, we might have, you might not remember to do the same authorization check. So when you get to the same node in the graph by a different path, you have to remember to check all of those edges in the graph when you're doing authorization at, at a field level. Um, and like I said, that's, this is a contrived example, obviously, but this is more or less a copy of a thing that we, a mistake that we actually made. Uh, some high level general advice if you do want to get started with GraphQL, um, start slow. Uh, if you have a new uh, API field you want to implement, put it in a GraphQL query and do that one thing. Um, if you're already making REST calls from whatever client your API is, is interacting with, it's really easy to have your new one be a GraphQL query. But you can just pull out the URL, drop it in there, and treat it basically the same. Uh, write your docs as you go. Um, we got our API to about uh, 150 types and uh, four or 500 fields before we started making a, a significant effort to write the documentation. Uh, it feels pretty daunting at that point. Um, even if it's just short little messages you know, from the developer, write your docs early and often do them when you're writing the API. I recommend making it part of your continuous integration checks. Um, add, don't change. Um, if you have a field and you want to change how it behaves, don't feel bad about doing a new version of the field, uh, either separated with an argument or uh, an interface, uh, things like that. Um, keeps things backwards compatible, and in most cases, you can use the same resolver. You don't even have to duplicate code. It's just one of them is being called from a place where it behaves in slightly different, a slightly different way. And then thinking in graphs. That's probably the most important thing and also the most difficult is to, at a high level, start conceptualizing your data as not a series of endpoints or the individual bits of data, but the conceptual graph of what your data represents. Uh, that's it. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks to my buddy Joe and my wife Kim for helping me work on this. And. Uh, Again, I'll recommend this talk is on GitHub and the awesome GraphQL list of GraphQL resources to uh, get you all the information you could ever want. Any questions? Subscription updates, uh, is that based off of a standard pub sub message queue like the active MQ or something? Uh, the backend implementation is agnostic. Okay. Um, for the, the few applications where our app uses it, we use the Redis PubSub, um, but there's there's nothing defined that you have to. Um, the uh, AWS has a GraphQL implementation called AppSync, I think, and theirs is based off of their uh, SNS notification system. Um, so yeah, it's agnostic, but you certainly could use ActiveMQ. Have you done any side-by-side -side comparisons of, say, a Node.js developed REST API and a graphing API? Yeah, so that, that was what we did, is over the past two years, we, we basically rewrote our API. Um, it, it, there were some changes at the time. We were also changing out the database, switching from a SQL-backed uh, product to one that's backed by Elasticsearch and also SQL and also a couple other things. Um, but I, I can tell you that our experience was that it's easier to write the GraphQL API and it's easier for the developers to consume it. Um, the, uh, some of the gotchas, um, this talk was supposed to convince you so I didn't talk about the bad stuff, but I will. Um, some of the bad stuff is it's really easy for your developers to get themselves in trouble. Um, so we have a lot of conceptual links in our database and it's very easy to write yourself a query that'll take five minutes to complete because you're recursively fetching data, you know, 15 levels deep. Um, you know, each one of those queries spawns 10 more queries and 10 more. Uh, it's real easy to get yourself in trouble like that. So, in one sense, it's easier for your, your front end developers, but in another sense, it is putting more of the responsibility for performance and stuff onto them because they have to be aware of, to some extent, oh, I can't use this field in the same query 
because I want this to return fast and that's going to make it take an extra 10 seconds. All right. Oh, sure. Um, so it seems to be served over standard HTTP verbs. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen it integrated with any other API management suites like API CAS or Freescale? Uh, I'm not familiar with either of those. Um, I've used it over the AWS API gateway. Mm -hmm. it's the same thing, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, it works pretty well with those since the, most of the time you use it as standard post requests. Um, the, the, one of the other downsides that you struggle with is it's hard to do that high level API caching um, since it is post request most of the time. So you tend to have to build out your caching layer in the API itself. It's harder to build it out at that um, you know, server level. Yeah. Not impossible though, just it, it makes it more complex. You can keep going. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all. <laughs>